Morris Berman is a cultural historian and social critic. Up next, he discusses his book, The Twilight of American Culture, which argues that, like all civilizations before us, our culture will die and start anew. He talks about the influence of consumerism, technology, and spirituality on American life in a program that lasts about an hour. Good evening and welcome to Olson's Books and Records Metro Center here in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. This is an um, ongoing uh, program. We never stop. We have a couple of authors a week. I uh, wanted to mention, by way of introduction, some of the other uh, upcoming events soon to occur here. Amy Bender, uh, who wrote The Girl in the Flammable Skirt, a series of short stories, has a first novel out now called An Invisible Sign of My Own. It's about an elementary school math teacher. Very dreamlike, very nice. She'll be here Tuesday, August 1st, 7 p.m. Nathaniel Philbrick, uh, In the Heart of the Sea, currently on sale here, will be uh, here at Metro Center August 3rd uh, with his book, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex. That's the subtitle. Again, Nathaniel Philbrick, In the Heart of the Sea. Uh, Gerald M. Starr, Air Wars, The Fight to Reclaim Public Broadcasting, uh, will be here Wednesday, August the 9th, 7 p.m. Elizabeth Berg, author of Durable Goods and Until the Real Thing Comes Along, has a new novel called Open House. She'll be here Thursday, August the 10th. Uh, Thursday, August the 31st, skipping to the end of next month, Stephen Ambrose, author of Undaunted Courage and uh, numerous other books, has a new book called Nothing Like It in the World, The Men Who Built the Transcontinental Railroad, 1865 to 1869. This will not be here at the Metro Center Olson's, but a block over at the uh, National Press Club Ballroom. Tickets cost $5. The rest of the events, of course, are free. Uh, tonight's event is Morris Berman, author of the new book, The Twilight of American Culture. He's also written five other previous books, uh, among them my favorite, Coming to Our Senses, The Hidden History of the Body in the West. Is that the right subtitle? Yes. Body and Spirit in, in the Hidden History of the West. Yes, it's an excellent book. Uh, we have a couple of copies left of it. Uh, a forthcoming book any day now will be Wandering God. Uh, that's another, actually out. That's actually out, excuse me, and we'll have it in stock shortly. Uh, but tonight's book, uh, The Twilight of American Culture, points out some uh, serious roadblocks to our, the longevity of our, our culture. And I'm sure Morris will uh, describe them in detail, but also an option, uh, the monastic option, perhaps a way out. Uh, very interesting material, and please join me in welcoming Morris Berman. Hi, thanks a lot. I'm, can I do this without a microphone? Or do, do you need a microphone? Yeah, okay. Tell you what, you're taller than me, I think. Let's, let's just lower this a few inches. Do something like that. Okay. Everybody hear me? Right? Okay. Um, this uh, book is a real departure for me. I mean, normally I um, do books that are like very thick and they have footnotes that go on for several pages in small fonts and you use a microscope or, you know, magnifying glass and they're pu published by university presses and they sell six copies and I suspect my mother buys four of those, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then I'm cornered at cocktail parties and people say, tell me what this is about. And I really feel uncomfortable and it's very esoteric and I don't want to have the discussion and all that. Um, and I just have another scotch, you know. Um, this was a very different one. The, the, well, that last one that um, Matthew just mentioned, I began, I got the idea for Wandering God. It's about hunter-gatherers and nomadic peoples. And I got the idea in 1990. It just appeared. It took me 10 years. This one was written in 18 months. Um, it, uh, although I, you know, I have all my sources at the back, there are no footnotes. And um, when I'm cornered at a cocktail party and people say, tell me about it, I say, don't even get me started. You know, you want to be here for six hours listening to a raving madman. This is the wrong question to ask, you know. Um, the one thing I want to say about it is it's, you know, it's not... I guess the most popular thing to write a book, wouldn't appear, appeal to the American mainstream, I can imagine, to write a book that essentially says um, this is the twilight period of American civilization and there really isn't a whole lot we can do about that. That's just the way it is. Um, 
so, you know, I mean, it, on one level, it's going to run against the grain of American optimism, which it goes back at least to Ralph Waldo Emerson. And if you weren't raised on that, you were raised on Walt Disney. So basically all our feelings are there's always an answer and everything's fine, really, and so on. Um, the, and yet at the same time, um, that, you know, it would be something that I think wouldn't be easily accepted. The truth is that the argument is a no-brainer. Uh, the obvious is, obviousness of it seems to me quite clear. Um, at this, one week after this book was released, Jacques Barzun published a book called Dawn to Decadence, which argues the same thing. He says this is the twilight phase of our culture. In fact, he's more pessimistic than I am. He predicts a renaissance for about 300 years from now. I figure maybe the 22nd century. I'm not sure, you know. So Jacques and I have to have a little talk, you know. Um, but it, it, to me, it's an obvious, I mean, the, the central thesis is an obvious historical fact. And that is to say, uh, there are no exceptions. All civilizations come to an end. There's just no exception on the historical record. And why would be, we be the exception? If somebody came up to you in the street and said, you know, I've decided to live forever, you would say this is called denial. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite clear. And so the real question is not whether the United States American civilization is going to come undone. It's when, okay? And I'm pegging it for the later part of this century. Um, this is a difficult book also to, uh, you know, to do a reading from because it has very different parts. And I sort of am worried about misleading the audience. That is to say, if I pick, there are a number of diverse topics, although it comes together, and it's together as a whole, I believe. There are a number of diverse topics in this, so there's a problem for me of, if I just pick one part, um, you'll think that's what the book is about. <laughs> and there are other parts. So I'd like to give you a little road map, basically. Just talk, you know, what the outline is. Um, the comparison I make, of course, is with the Roman Empire. Just as though, as politically, for several hundred years, we had a Pax Romana, now we've had for a century and probably, you know, much of the century to come, a Pax Americana, although the Roman one was political and ours is economic. Um, four factors, as far as I can see, were in, involved in that disintegration. The first is an uh, enormous gap between rich and poor. Um, in the Rome of Nero's time, and that's early still, 54 to 68 AD, 2,000 individuals owned all of the land between the Rhine and the Euphrates. I mean, that's just breathtaking. Well, 1% of the American public owns 47% of the wealth. You know, that's breathtaking too. And lots and lots of statistics. John Cassidy does all this stuff regularly in the New Yorker, really, of, of uh, CEO salaries and the ratios. You know, 1950, the CEO the ratio of CEO to average worker in a company was 40 to 1 salary ratio. It's now over 400 to 1. You know, I mean, all of these things are quite, quite clear. Uh, it's never been like this. Even in the Gilded Age of the robber barons, you know, it, it, it was not like this in the United States. The second is an idea that um, strikes me as very important that I take from Joseph Tainter's book, um, The Collapse of Complex Societies, which I think was published in 89. Tainter. Um, argues that there comes a point in every, in the decline of every culture where what happens is very obvious and very economic. That is to say, a point is reached at which the money to keep that's collected for taxes dead ends. It just recycles into the bureaucracy that collects the taxes. So you're not getting anywhere. You're running like a rat on a treadmill. And what then happens is, it's so you start off in the growth phase, and every culture goes through growth, you know, birth, efflorescence, and decay. That's just it. So what happens, you know, you plateau out for a while, and then the thing that starts to turn is when you're collecting money just to keep the money collecting machinery going. And I, I think we're about 10 or 15 years away from that. But the, hand is, the handwriting is on the wall. We're going to run out of money for Medicare if nothing is done. 2015, uh, Social Security runs out 2034. Um, you know, these are major entitlement programs that we can't exactly sidestep. And they require enormous amounts of money, and they're not going to be there. Um, so there's a point of diminishing returns, and that's, that's Tainter's argument. The third is a decline of literacy 
and um, intellectual awareness, general intellectual awareness. This has become so obvious that I really probably don't have to even mention this to this audience. You know, common words are now misspelled in, on CNN and in supermarkets. They never get Caesar salad right. Have you noticed that? You know, it's only five more years they won't be able to get salad right. You know, it's <laughs> really, I mean, I, this is not a joke. It's just a matter of time, you know. Um, and you just run into this uh, all the time. I mean, there's just some wonderful, horrible stuff, you know. Uh, woman inter interviewed by a newspaper in Sheboygan, Illinois, on the street. They were interviewing people on the street, asking if they thought, people thought George W. Bush was intelligent enough to be president. She replied, he's pretty smart, but he doesn't know very much. A good Bush voter, I would say. You know. um, we've got a presidential candidate. Uh, it's amazing that he would even be considered, and the chances are he's going to win, dumb as a stick. Uh, Doonesbury has done a great job of qu just quoting from campaign speeches. We ought to make the pie higher. I understand small business growth. I was one. Rarely is the question asked, is our children learning? Clearly he wasn't. You know. uh, he probably hasn't read a serious book in his life. You know. Um, but the stats, you know, 60% of Americans have never read a single book. 120 million Americans are functionally illiterate. I mean, wow. We are 48th in literacy in the world. You know, 48th. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots of, of material on this. Um, and then the fourth factor is what I call spiritual death, essentially apathy. This was the thesis of... Um, uh, Oswald Spengler in The Decline of the West, where he said basically a civilization comes to the point where it's just repackaging old formulas. And so it has all the old slogans, but they've become kitsch. And in a, in a sense, uh, the governments are corrupt. People don't take what's going on seriously. I mean, a woman, I was just reading last week, some woman at a right-wing think tank compared the current presidential election to a student government election. You know high school is about as significant, you know, kind of thing. Um, and, and with that, an enormous sense of uh, ennui and um, really lack of civility. Uh, the same, you know, I was reading this, this, this from Doonesbury, that same weekend, George Will did a piece in Outlook called A Gross Out Culture, <laughs> you know, and he just listed that common lack of civility. I mean, you just, I'm sure you've all got your anecdotes. I run into it on a daily basis, you know. Um, Four years ago, for the first time I'd ever seen this, the Chronicle of Higher Education had began to have um, lists for conferences on the erosion of civility in the United States. I had never seen that before. You know, all this is, is relatively new. Um, so those are, I mean, just to give you that roadmap, those are four factors that are involved in decline. And then I talk about a number of other things. Um, for example, I discuss how decline of civilization has been treated in literature in various ways. Uh, there's a whole discussion of uh, what I call, you know, the whole dialectic of the American economy, starting with an Enlightenment tradition and a very vibrant sort of economic uh, uh, beginnings in the 18th century, and how the pursuit of that itself finally winds up um, with the kind of corporate consumerism and set of values that we have today. Um, there's a chapter Matthew was mentioning about the monastic option. That was originally the working title of this book, The Monastic Option. And what I was talking about was, if we're going to make comparisons with Rome, there is one gleam of light here. That is that uh, starting from about uh, the fourth century, but certainly taking off by the sixth century, um, there was a group, uh, I, would, I would hesitate to say a class, but a group of monks uh, Benedictine and also in Ireland, uh, so Benedictine on the continent and in Ireland, that basically started sequestering classics of Roman and Greek civilization. Copying manuscripts, putting them in scriptoria and libraries, cathedral libraries later and so on. And this material preserved uh, some of the most important things of, of Western Civ. What then happened then by the 11th and 12th centuries when there was a revival in Western Europe, starting with an economic revival, perhaps a revival of the towns, 
um, that material then flowed into the mainstream and it was a very major factor in the 12th century Renaissance and beyond. So I talk about people that are doing things not in terms of group organization, uh, although some of that would obviously be valuable, but individuals who are doing things to preserve some of the things in Western culture. So after this dark age, which I don't see as avoidable, um, twilight, however, does imply a dawn. So, you know, there will be a later period. And then I talk about possible, you know, political, social and political formations for the 21st century and beyond. So that's the, the map of the whole thing. Um, let me, in, in any case, read from one section and then we can uh, uh, talk about it. Um, the following data are going to seem invented. This is from the part <laughs> Uh, early in the book about that third factor about the decline of literacy in American intelligence. The following data are going to seem invented. Please be assured they are not. 42% of American adults cannot locate Japan on a world map. And according to Garrison Keillor, uh, this is National Public Radio, March 22nd, 1997, another survey revealed that nearly 15% couldn't locate the United States. Keillor remarked that this was like not being able to grab your rear end with both hands, unquote. And he suggested that we stop being so assiduous on the eve of elections about trying to get out the vote. Why, why are we so assiduous? I can't figure that out. A survey taken in October 1996 revealed that one in 10 voters did not know who the Republican or Democratic nominees for president were. This is particularly sobering when one remembers that one of the questions traditionally asked in psychiatric wards as part of the test for sanity is, who is the president of the United States? <laughs> One out of ten Americans are clinically insane. These are your neighbors. They borrow sugar from you. Very few Americans understand the degree to which corporations have taken over their lives. But according to a poll taken by Time magazine, nearly 70% of them believe in the existence of angels. Another study turned up the fact that 50% believe in the presence of UFOs and space aliens on Earth, while a Gallup poll in 1997 revealed that 71% believe that the U.S. government is engaged in a cover-up about the subject. More than 30% believe they have made contact with the dead. A 1995 article in the New York Times reported the results of a survey that revealed that 40% of American adults, this could be upward of 70 million people, did not know that Germany was our enemy in World War II. A Roper survey conducted in 1996 revealed that 84% of American college seniors couldn't say who was president at the start of the Korean War. 58% of American high school seniors cannot understand a newspaper editorial in any newspaper. And the U.S. Department of Education survey of 22,000 students in 1995 revealed that 50% were unaware of the Cold War and 60% had no idea how the United States came into existence. At one point in 1996, Jay Leno invited a number of high school students to be on his television program and asked them to complete famous quotations from major American documents such as the Gettysburg Address. Declaration of Independence. Their response in each case was to stare at him blankly. As a kind of follow-up on his show of June 3, 1999, Leno screened a video of interviews he had conducted a few days before at a university graduation ceremony. He did not identify the institution in question. He told his TV audience only that the students he had interviewed include graduate students as well as undergraduates. The group included men, women, and people of color. Leno posed eight questions as follows. One, who designed the first American flag? Answers included Susan B. Anthony, who was born in 1820, and Betsy Ford. <laughs> Two, who were the 13, what were the 13 colonies free from after the American Revolution? One student said the East Coast. <laughs> Love that. Three, what was the Gettysburg Address? One student replied, an address to Getty. Another said, I don't know the exact address. Four, who invented the light bulb? Answers included Thomas Jefferson. Five, what is three squared? One student said 27, another said six. What is the six? What is the boiling point of water? Answers included 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Seven, how long does it take the earth to rotate once on its axis? The two, Leno, two answers Leno received here were light years, which is a matter, measure distance, not time, and go figure this one out, 24 axes. Eight. How many moons does the Earth have? The student question said she had taken astronomy a few years back and had gotten an A in the course, but that she couldn't remember the correct answer. 
How many moons does the earth have? What would Galileo think? You know, he was dealing with four, you know. It is important to note that not a single student interviewed had the correct answer to any of these questions. Leno's comment on this pathetic debacle says it all. And the Chinese are stealing secrets from us? <laughs> A 1998 survey by the National Constitution Center revealed that only 41% of American teenagers can name the three branches of government, but 59% can name the three stooges. Only 2% can name the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. 26% were unable to identify the Vice President. In the early 1990s, the National Assessment of Education Progress reported that 50% of 17-year-olds could not express 9 over 100 as a percentage and nearly 50% couldn't place the Civil War in the correct half century. Data that the San Antonio Express News characterized as, quote, evidence of the steady lobotomizing of American culture. In another study of 17-year-olds, only 4% could read a bus schedule. Only 12% could arrange six common fractions in order of size. Ignorance of the most elementary scientific facts on the part of American adults is nothing less than breathtaking. In a survey conducted for the National Science Foundation in October 1995, 56% of those polled said electrons were larger than atoms. 63% said that the earliest human beings lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, a chronological era of more than 60 million years. 53% said the Earth revolves around the sun in either a day or a month. That is, only 47% understood that it takes a year for the Earth to get around the sun. Um, and 91% were unable to state what a molecule was. A random telephone survey of more than 2,000 adults conducted by Northern Illinois University revealed that 21% believed that the sun revolved around the Earth, with an additional 7% saying that they didn't know which revolved around which. Oh, oh it's 49th, not 40th. Of the 158 countries in the United Nations, the United States ranks 49th in literacy. Roughly 60% of the adult population has never read a book of any kind and only 6% reads as much as a book a year, where book is defined to include harlequin romances and self-help novels. Something, self-help manuals, sorry. Something like 120 million adults are illiterate or read at no better than a fifth grade level. Among readers aged 21 to 35, 67% regularly read a daily newspaper in 1965 as compared with 31% in 1998. In a telephone survey conducted in 1998, 12% of Americans asked who the wife of the biblical Noah was, said Joan of Arc. You know, Noah and Mrs. Arc, right? In 1997, as a hoax, the Attorney General of the State of Missouri submitted a proposal to an international academic accrediting agency to establish an institution he named Eastern Missouri Business College, which would grant doctorates in marine biology and genetic engineering, <laughs> as well as in business. The faculty would include inter alia, Mo Howard, Jerome Howard, and Larry Fine. That is the three stooges. And the proposed motto on the college seal roughly translated from Latin was, education is for the birds. The response, academic accreditation was granted. In 1998, the Massachusetts Board of Education instituted a literary te literacy test for teachers pegged at the level of an exam of a high school equivalency diploma. Of the 1,800 prospective teachers who took it, 59% failed. This is grammar and spelling. You know. In response to this, the interim commissioner of education, one Frank Haydu III, may his name be blessed, announced that the passing grade would be lowered. The board finally reversed the decision and the commissioner resigned, but that 59% of a large group of potential teachers had severe problems with high school spelling and punctuation, and that the educational administrator would declare that this is no obstacle to the performance of their jobs is as good an indicator as any of the twilight phase of our nation. Um, then, I, you know, then I have uh, a, a number of um, anecdotes here that I'm sure you all you know, he have a sign outside of a hospital. It's up on Capitol Hill. Maybe they took it down by now. I don't know. It's outside of a, cap a hospital in uh, Washington, D.C. Infant children in adult care. Children is spelled C-H-I-L-D-E-R-N. This is a manufactured sign. It wasn't, you know, uh, we're not talking magic markers here. They made a sign. Um, 
A visit I made a few years ago to several creative writing classes at a college in the Midwest only to discover that not a single student in any of these classes had ever heard of Robert Browning, whereas I was memorizing my last duchess when I was in high school. A colleague at the same school telling me that one of his students, a 20-year-old male, said he had never read a novel. Um, well, you get the idea. I mean, it's uh, one, one other. I'm asked to give a lecture at a Southwestern University on, quote, the crisis of American intelligence. The talk is written up for the school newspaper by a student in her late 30s in an article of fewer than 250 words. That's one page, double space type. There are seven errors of elementary grammar and one completely incoherent sentence. I am guessing that this was not a deliberate attempt to satirize the lecture, which would have, in fact, been wonderful. So, you know, I mean, there's, this is just one part of, of, this, of this whole thing, really. And um, the, what are we left with? Um, the, I talk about the whole issue of, um, you know, the monastic option. Um, oh, I just, one more anecdote. I have to, you know, I'm getting email as a result of publishing the book. Okay. So people say, you think that's bad? Let me think. You know. uh, this is from somebody in uh, Michigan. Uh, this was related to, be, to me by my mother, whose simple high school education in the 20s still uh, put, puts her uh, intelligence level far above most of young people today. She went down to her local drugstore, which contains a post office, to mail a package to New Mexico. The clerk told her there was no New Mexico, there was only Mexico. My mother insisted and the clerk said there was no such state as New Mexico. They actually had to call in a supervisor to settle the matter who confirmed to the clerk by showing him on a map that there was indeed a state named New Mexico. And then he it gives me this bit of information that on um, ABC television, February 3rd this year, Peter Jennings did a thing on the Grand Canyon stamp. I was unaware of this, that the post office had run off thousands and thousands of stamps, you know, welcome to Colorado, showing the Grand Canyon. It's in Arizona. They had to destroy thousands of stamps. Who's doing this? You know? um, the... Anyway, I mean, that's the, the general gist of it. And as I say, that, you know, there are all these other factors that are involved in our decline. I just wanted to conclude with the Millennium um, editorial in the New York Times, January 1st, 2000. Just a little paragraph. No civilization lasts forever. America, a thousand years hence, will be something very different if it exists at all. None of this, however, relieves us of the obligation to do what is within our power. That is to help form the future by bequeathing the best of what we have learned about constructing and sustaining an enlightened civilization. History teaches that the surest way to reach across time is through the transmission of enduring values and ideals. The convictions of Washington and Jefferson still guide us today, just as the ideas of the ancient Greeks and enlightenment philosophers emboldened them. We have a similar opportunity to inspire coming generations by projecting toward them the principles that we have honed in more recent times. That can be the distinctive legacy of our age. Thank you. So, questions? Yeah. There was a cartoon in the New Yorker a number of years ago of these, there's a, a bar and these gentlemen in their fedoras are sitting around looking glumly at one another. One of them says uh, something like, uh, if it wasn't for the American sense of humor, this country would be in a hell of a mess. And I wanted to ask you, well, what about the great American sense of humor? Isn't that going to... Well, I'm trying to be a representative of that, obviously. I don't know if I've succeeded. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's fine. I don't know. You see, the problems that I'm really describing in this book are structural. This book got reviewed one week ago today uh, in the Christian Science Monitor. It was reviewed together with a book uh, that I haven't read, but I can't, the title was something like The Promise Ahead or something like that, you know? And um, typically, the author of that book, from what I understand from the review, said, well, the real answer is we've got to mature. See, we've got to give up our uh, obsession with consumerism and we've got to uh, be less egotistical and self-absorbed and 
great prescription. I don't know how you make that happen. I don't know how that has anything to do with structural factors that bring a civilization down. Humor is fine. I mean, I think that's, you know, you might think from what I wrote that I'm a pretty pessimistic guy. Actually, I get up in the morning, it's quite, I feel quite upbeat, you know. Um, but it's, it's sort of, I mean, that's fine. But I don't think things like that, we're talking about a train that's running down tracks. And you can, you know, tickle it with a feather and whisper this and that. But its course, I think, is pretty clear. So I think humor can help us get through this. What do you think the role of technology is going to be to try, try to change this uh, going down the tracks? Business? As far as I can see, it's made things demonstrably worse, um, especially since the microchip revolution from about 1985. Um, that is to say, it's created a society in which people don't really talk to each other. They talk to somebody else on a cell phone while they're in a restaurant. I mean, working in the Johns Hopkins library, cell phones go off and students answer the phones. And I, what are you doing? You know, I mean, it's a library. Um, and there's, you know, that's the kind of communication. Or they sit in front of screens all day. It's also been something that fuels the consumer economy, you know. Um, I remember in 1984, I was asked to speak at a conference at the University of Victoria about technology in the future or something like that. And I thought he was quite insane. There was a guy from, you know, it wasn't IBM, but some major computer firm saying that within a few years, we would be able to sit home and shop from our screens and that that was the purpose of this technology and it would make our life wonderful. I thought he was crazy. Boy, I was crazier than he was. It all came true. Everything he said came true. Is this a better world? I tend to doubt it. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, Toffler, the third wave, you know, he talks in 72, he was talking about institutions changing and going through systems. I mean, you don't see this as maybe, maybe a, like the second wave. I mean, the agriculture, the industrial. Third, wave. third Thank you, thank you. The, you know, it's yeah. beginning to crumble and with a new, it, things start getting made anew. Mm -hmm. I, I realize that's probably an optimistic view. Yeah, and I, I have to tell you that I just think that Toffler is a very superficial thinker. I mean, it basically is sort of like just skimming the surface of historical impressions and then saying things like, well, what we need to get out of where we're at is just more industrialization in a different way. I think that's very unlikely myself. I mean, the, the, the trend, I mean he wouldn't pay any attention to trends like falling rates of literacy, uh, widening gap between rich and poor. I don't know who he's talking to, but it's a kind of whiz-bang, new age, technological, Peter Drucker sort of group, you know, that thinks that, you know, well, you just need a kind of commercial, administrative, industrial, whatever it is, revolution, and we're all going to be happy campers, you know, I think it's unlikely, yes. Uh, you kind of compared the, the Pax Americana to Pax Romana. Uh -huh. Uh, one thing that happened with the decline of the Roman civilization was it had ramifications outside of its own borders. Uh, are you looking at the American situation or the decline of American society and culture within just the borders of the United States, or do you think that there is also some emerging uh, entity that may be able to pick up where left off? Yeah, good question. Really good question. Um, the last chapter of the book deals with alternative possibilities in terms of sociopolitical configurations that might, in fact, uh, be what emerge in the 22nd century. I do take that on. Uh, my own model for that is the World Systems Theory School. Uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein, for example, about you know um, sy major systemic changes that happen in civilization. And I would recommend to this audience uh, uh, his slender book called Utopistics, which is a really good study of possible social formations future time. So I do talk about those types of things, but obviously there are going to be enormous ramifications of this because um, we're in this, you know, any fluctuation that happens on the NYSE is felt in the Nikkei the next day, you know. I mean, we're tied into. One of the things about Rome is that you could collapse and it didn't make a difference on the other side of the globe. We don't have that situation anymore. It's highly interconnected. And so, the, you know, I mean, in terms of future guesses, one might say the most likely candidate to fill the power vacuum would probably be China. That's what I would guess. But I'm not going to be around anyway. I'm just going to be sitting in bars with a fedora making jokes. You know, so. Yes? I'm having a little trouble really understanding where you're going since I haven't really 
I haven't read your book. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by American culture? What is it that um, we're going to be losing here? Well, there is a, you know, I mean, this was founded in the 18th century on certain principles. It, it has had um, a tradition of certain uh, writers and thinkers. It's followed, uh, you know, certain ideals that I think are largely derived from the Enlightenment tradition of Europe. Um, and uh, it has been a very coherent sort of thing, um, and one that people could identify with. There are lots of, you know, you read standard history, American history books, and their chapters about melting pot immigration and all that. My parents were part of that, coming over at Ellis Island in 1920, all that sort of thing. What we have now is the sense that there is no center. What we have now is a sense of drifting. Don DeLillo has made it the focus of his novels, the, the unstated premise that at some point around John Kennedy's assassination, we lost our moorings. We don't have a sense of direction now. There doesn't seem to be a sense of purpose. What has filled the vacuum, that would be a spiritual vacuum, I think, and what's filled it is a kind of corporate consumerism. That's what people are largely involved with. That's what the United States largely does. It makes money based on creating objects, creating need for those objects through advertising, and then selling them. And that's what it largely does. Uh, the up to now, one could say that you know much of what America stood for uh, were a tradition of democracy, a tradition of technological innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. All that's you know. Fine. I mean, but it has come along in a certain, there are dark sides to those developments as well. And in one of the chapters I write, called The Dialectic of Enlightenment, what I argue is, pushed far enough, things turn into their opposites. There is a dark side of democracy. Alexis de Tocqueville talked about it. We've got it now. There is a dark side to technological innovation. Alvin Toffler would be an excellent example of that. So we have gone, uh, we have peaked, and there's, a, there's an unraveling process now that's happening. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I keep wondering, uh, where is the refutation of Malthusian theory? You know, is there any reason to be optimistic in the very least if population increases and, you know, the gulf between rich and poor, which is in the book you didn't really mention, mm -hmm. um, the climbing <laughs> literacy rates, which you did. Uh, at what point, in other words, do we forget about spiritual death? What about physical death? What about uh, pollution and uh, overpopulation. Yeah, those are problems, of course, that are largely beyond our borders. And as far as overpopulation goes, the United States is probably not in the worst situation, you know, as, as what does India have now? I mean, I, I don't know, but you know, um, maybe a billion? I, I mean, I don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, but uh, those are the types of things that will come home, but in a sense of shockwaves because they're borderless problems. There's no border for pollution, you know, and so on. Still, you know, there, there are, you know, serious attempts to use science and technology to clean things up. Um, it's possible, for all I know, that Lake Erie is better now than it was 30 years ago, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read your book either, and I haven't thought this through, but I'm, I'm thinking there are many books now talking about how everything's speeding up, and I, you always see that nice mm -hmm. graph of history. Would the monasticism have been an instance, for example, of, of slowing things down? <clears throat> Might that be a solution? Yeah, absolutely. Or, absolutely. or did old cultures speed, ever speed up because they did not have the technology we do them now? But yeah. Now, yeah. Well, I mean, th you know, th these are good questions, really. I mean, certainly the monastic situation is an enormous slowdown of time. And I think, frankly, one of the healthiest responses, I mean, I, I have to work so hard just to stay in place, you know. I mean, I feel this every day. And one of the, I think one of the healthiest responses one can do is to return to a space in which you're not allowing that to happen in your life. I mean, just for your own sanity. Whether that, uh, you know, whether we can say that uh, they were in the context of a speeded up culture then, that I tend to doubt. This strikes me as being a very modern phenomenon, really a very modern phenomenon. Yeah. Somebody else, yeah. Uh, in your book, you mentioned ad busters as yeah. an example of the monastic uh, mm -hmm. idea. And in a recent issue, they uh, focused on the rampant 
prescription of drugs like Prozac. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on how that relates to your uh, thesis? Yeah, I mean, this is the part of the dark side of this, the hectic pace of life and also a sense of meaninglessness, you know, that's going on. 1999, uh, three billion prescriptions were filled in the United States. A large chunk of those were for Valium, Prozac, Zoloft, Wellbutrin, uh, Paxil, I mean, all psychoactive drugs that essentially cool you out, you know. Why would that be? And incidentally, that figure has been rising steadily 5% every year. So 2000, the figure is estimated to be 5% more, 2001, 5% more of that. What does it say about a civilization that is basically a medicated society? That's only prescription drugs. Feed in illegal narcotics that flow through uh, this country, you know, in and out of ghettos and so on and so forth. Just feed in that. Feed in just simple white-collar three-martini lunches, rates of alcoholism. This is a sad country. I mean, basically, what's, what, that to me, that, those kinds of data indicate to me that people have pretty unhappy inner lives, you know. I don't see that a civilization can really sustain itself without an energy that says, I do want to get up in the morning. I do want to do what I'm doing. You know, this kind of thing. I mean, I personally know of cases, for example, of people who have made the choice to stay with jobs or take jobs where they're making eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year and they feel they need that kind of money to survive and to take Prozac so that they can get through the day on a daily, get through their lives on a daily basis and manage the type of workload that that involves, you know? I mean, to, to me, that means that that's what I mean by spiritual death. Why, why would people be taking drugs anyway? I mean, I smoked a lot of marijuana in the 60s. You know, I inhaled, let me tell you. I inhaled a lot, you know. And, and yeah, it was fun. Now it's kind of boring. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not into it, you know. But one thing I know is that for me, it wasn't about my life felt impoverished. And so I had to keep doing it. You know, I mean, it wasn't about that. But... You know, the, the, it's, it's a very common thing, I think, the sensation of spiritual death. And then, in a sense, you get yourself into a state where nothing really matters too much and you're just floating through life, you know. I mean, those types of statistics um, of even just prescription psychoactive, psychoactive drug use in the United States that arise dramatically every year, to me, are killer statistics. They really say what's going on. You do not find that in major newspaper articles, you know, you know, so, yeah, anybody, yeah. Uh, do you see any hope in our multicultural society? Because um, the comparisons that you have used, you know, you're going on Rome and probably Greece, I haven't read your book, but, you know, one of the things that come out, one of the things that come out of that is that they were very uh, homogenous societies and I'm just wondering, because we have so many different pockets mm -hmm. inside of the United States, yeah. if uh, there can be some hope in, yeah. you know, in the division, you know, that the thought processes yeah. might not be Yeah, the same. it's a good question. Uh, with regard to homogenization, let me just say one thing. In the last chapter of the book, I talk about alternative socio-political formations that could occur. And one model I talk about, and I specifically say, although, although I don't think it could last forever, it's, as an intermediate solution, I don't think it's the worst we could face, and that's the Hellenistic model. Roughly, I mean, the dates are roughly 331, you know, BC to about 31, something like that. But Roughly, if we take the Hellenistic period from, let's say, 200 BC to 200 AD, this was not a homogenous society in the Mediterranean basin. It was very multicultural. And it was very interesting. It was very rich because you had to pay attention to the Roman umbrella. Everybody had to pay lip service to that. And if you challenge the authority of the state, for example, like the Jews of Palestine, the Roman machine came down in no uncertain terms. But basically, if you didn't do that and you just hid out, you know, hung out, there were all kinds of subcultures, and that may be a viable possibility. With regard to the situation in the United States, one of the problems is that with the exception of one um, minority group, 
uh, the other minority groups are having an awful lot of trouble financially and educationally for whatever reason. The minority group that succeeds are Asians. They do better than whites on standardized tests, especially in science. They do extremely well. Um, blacks and Hispanics don't do very well. Now, there are all kinds of reasons for that, but that those are the data. Um, July 4th, 1999, front page of the New York Times, there was an article of black leaders discussing the fact that regardless of socioeconomic class for African Americans, they do badly on standardized tests. And what does that mean in terms of their share of the economy and stuff like that? And, you know, I mean, all kinds of difficulties then ensue. And, you know, people like Jesse Jackson and so on were lamenting this and saying they didn't know what the answer was. They didn't know what the solution. Neither, I don't know either. But, you know, it's sort of like um, those types of problems strike me as real problems. I don't see in them somehow flipping over to a kind of Hellenistic model where this would enrich us, uh, they seem to be things that we can't seem to solve and they create the kinds of, uh, you know, uh, minority rage that I certainly understand and I think is, is justified, but we don't seem to have a way out of it because basically what we've learned is throwing money at the problem doesn't work either. So I don't know where we are with that, you know, yeah. Is the United States unique, or are the other Western industrialized countries in much the same shape? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, let me give one comparison. I mean, I wouldn't take this necessarily as a model for future government or something like that, but May, June, I spent a couple of weeks in Italy. Um, every day after uh, breakfast, I would sit in the garden of my hotel, and I would open the Milan newspaper, and there are two or three pages, whole pages, of articles on cultural analysis. The art of Giotto, Fellini's filmmaking, um, Holocaust survivor, Italian Holocaust survivors that Primo leave in, so I'm writing about experiences, and analyses of these things in such a way that these types of articles could only appear in the United States in specialized academic journals. If the Washington Post attempted to do that on a daily basis, it would be broke in a month. You know it and I know it. Nobody would buy the paper anymore. In Milan, it's been going on for decades. There is actually an intelligent, literary middle class that reads such as there was in the United States between roughly 1900 and 1960 or 65. You know, that has disappeared here. We only have a mass culture. We don't have a, a culture that buys Somerset Maugham, Graham Greene, and you know, they're, they're not happening it anymore. Ask the folks at Olson's what's selling, you know? It's gonna be new age and it's gonna be self-help manuals and stuff like that. It's not gonna be Graham Greene, okay? Um, so we're, we're in a, in a situation, now, you know, I mean, as far as using Italy as a model, uh, I don't know, I kind of have to admire a country that votes out its government every nine months. You know, there's something neat about that. I, I kind of like anarchy, you know. Um, there's something just wonderful about that in a certain way. At the same time, you know, I mean, I was aware of the fact that the lira wasn't very stable. A dollar was buying 2,000 lira at the time, which is, boy, not good for the Italians. You know, great for me, but, you know, to live there is a different story. And so it's, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, as somebody, somebody had earlier said, what are the repercussions outside our borders? And certainly the European countries are going to be affected by any downturn that we're involved in. But to travel around those countries, I have to tell you that when I got on the plane to the return to the United States, I wept. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean for example, the United States is a country that has substituted comfort for aesthetics. It happens all the time. And the result is the environment's kind of ugly. Walking around Italy is like, Huh, to die for. It's in, whether you're in the countryside or you're in the cities, aesthetically, this is so fabulous. Why can't we do that? Because we don't give a damn about that stuff. That's why. Yeah. What about the role of newspapers? I, I'm thinking in particular of the Washington Post. That we live overseas for a number of years. We come back to the States, we go overseas, we come back. And it seems every time I come back, the Washington Post is a worse newspaper. It's just getting dumber and dumber. <laughs> To the point where it's hard to find a story that reads like a news story anymore. They start off with little tales of 
someone sitting on a bench somewhere in a park or something. You have to get to page three before you find out what the story, what the news is. Yeah. And contrast that with Canada, just north of us, the Toronto Globe and Mail still reads like an excellent newspaper. Yeah. Like newspapers yeah. used to be in the 1950s right. in the United States. Right. Is the Washington Post deliberately, I, mean, I, I suppose not deliberately, but leading the decline, do you think? Or is yeah, this leading the, the decline, to but they're responding to the fact that if they don't dumb down, they won't sell. But on the other hand, they're, they're certainly in danger of losing me. I mean, I'm much more, less, I less likely to, to buy the newspaper than I used to be. I have to tell you something, be. sir. There are much more of the people that don't know who the president of the United States are than there are of you. Okay? You are not in the majority. Uh, in 1956, Adlai Stevenson, uh, running uh, for uh, election against Ike, uh, was at Vassar. And after he finished talking, one woman, a student at Vassar, stood up and said, Governor Stevenson, you have every thinking person's vote. And Adlai shot back, won't work, I need a majority. <laughs> now he would have to say, won't work, I need 10%. You know, you are not in the majority. Go ahead. Up. No, go ahead. Do you have an explanation for why Canada seems to somehow be doing differently? That educational system, you know, I taught for seven and a half years in Canada. I taught for two years in Concordia, uh, in Montreal, and then uh, uh, I taught at the University of Victoria in British Columbia for five and a half years. Um, and as far as I could determine, I mean, things, this was a long time ago and things may have changed. But as far as I could determine, um, it's a system that at least has some allegiance or derivation from an English, a British system, which has higher standards. And in that sense, you know, there's a greater emphasis on education. Uh, so it's not like I found, I can't say that I found Canadian students, that we're talking just on an undergraduate across the board sort of level, I can't say that I found Canadian students dramatically better than American students, but somehow the requirements, what was understood to be required, seemed at a bit higher level. Whether that's still true or not today, I really don't know. As far as newspapers go, I, I certainly agree with you about the Globe and Mail. It's really readable. It's, it's really high class. And actually, it compares in some ways with the Wall Street Journal, which remains a very good newspaper. Very good newspaper. Um, and so, you know, I don't know We'd have to talk about figures of circulation and things like that, and who's reading the Globe. It is the, the national Canadian newspaper. It's sold in Vancouver as well as Toronto or Montreal. But at the same time, most of the sales in Vancouver are the Vancouver Sun or the province, not the Globe and Mail. So I, I don't know how to make a judgment about that. Really. Somebody in the back had a question. Yeah. Um, I was just, I came in a little bit late, but um, I was curious from uh, the early parts of what I heard, seemed to be a great deal of idealization of, of the past. Uh, Fifty years ago, mm -hmm. you know, how intellectual life was um, was so dramatically better than it is today, mm -hmm. and, uh, and life just seemed to be a great deal better. And I, I really wonder if you look at uh, even this country or the globe as a whole, whether you can honestly say that we're worse off today than we've ever been, uh, mm -hmm. just with with no uh, great ideological opponent, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, there's certainly trouble. But is the trouble as bad as it as it has ever been? And materially, at least, it's I think virtually impossible to argue that there's been a better time in the history of humanity. Uh, oh, I I would say there have been many better times in the history of humanity. It isn't the case that as you go further and down the chronological line that life has gotten better. There have been many cases of happier civilizations and so on. I mean, the United States, is, it's not, it's not, this is not progress. Um, progress has to have more things in it than the number of toys we have in our environment. But you did miss the beginning, and what I was talking about was inequalities of wealth. You talk about prosperity. Um, what we've got is a situation now worse than in any time in American history of differential of a rich and poor. One percent of the American population owns 47 percent of the wealth poor, in this country. They there are more of them and they're below the poverty line. It's gotten larger and larger. So although you could... Because there's more immigrants though. Are there, are there factors that you can call into question to say that this is why there's poor because we've got a million immigrants coming in every year that are largely unskilled. Is yeah, that, I mean, right, that may be the case. That may be the case. But the, the question is, 
if we're talking about quality of life, what do we have here, you know? If people say to me, um, well, you know, I mean, maybe people didn't even read at all previously or, or you know, something like that, uh, my answer to that is at least um, the, the tradition was, there was a vibrant middle class that did, and at least that was the ideal. When you're saying, well, we're, gonna, we're letting more immigrants in, my response is, what are we letting them in to, you know? Um, that's, that's the issue, I think, that we have to talk about. Somebody over here. Uh, yeah. No, I, saw, uh, I, I often have some information on this. Other people probably aware of this, too. Average, uh, real, in real terms, uh, wages have actually declined, uh, which is indicative of this, of this split between uh, uh, the wealthy and uh, forget the poor, just the not, you know, the average mm -hmm. American. Uh, the real yeah. wages have actually declined. So, it's not so much uh, an influx of uh, an influx of immigrants or, or or other criteria. This is just data from 1985, yeah. and it wouldn't be it wouldn't have been large enough to actually affect you know the real wage of the average American worker as much if this if this uh, disparity had been. Broken. Yeah, and it, you know as far as thank you, and as far as rates of literacy goes, I mean Lawrence Stone, the great American historian who died last year, did a study of history of literacy in the United States and demonstrated that we were more literate as a whole. The nation was more literate as a whole in the 17th century than it is today. You know, I mean, it's, it's cannot, I don't think it can, can be argued that we're in our best period. I think that would be a tough one. So, anything else? Thank you. Thank you again for coming. Uh, books are available on the table. We do have, uh, again, a few copies of Coming to Our Senses and uh, quite a few of The Twilight of American Culture. Cashiers are uh, on my left. Thank you so much for attending. Morris Berman is a cultural historian and social critic. He teaches in the Master of Liberal Arts program at Johns Hopkins University. His previous books include Wandering God and Reenchantment of the World. His new book, The Twilight of American Culture, is published by W.W. W. Norton and Company.